Okay. Well, my name is David Chamberlain, and this is uh, actually my first run through with this thing. And since we got such a small group, uh, let's keep it informal. And if you do have a question as we're going along, please raise your hand. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end as well. Uh, I'm a retired dairy farmer. Uh, I farmed in, in northern Wyoming County uh, for 50 years from 68 until 2018. Um, sold out to my uh, uh, brother, who's 17 years younger than I am, and, and his oldest son. And for the last, I'm going on seven years, I've been working with New York FarmNet and uh, as a financial, consu uh, financial consultant. So uh, I've been through actually four iterations of partnerships and LLCs. So uh, first went into partnership, my dad, when I came home from school in 68. <clears throat> and then my brother came home in uh, 86 and we formed a three-way partnership. This was before LLCs. And uh, then my dad uh, in the uh, early 90s got out of the business. It was just my brother and myself. So we went back to a two-way partnership. And at that time we formed an LLC. And then when his son came into the business in uh, around 2010, uh, we formed another. So four, four different iterations. Uh, and then my buyout in, in uh, 2017. So I'm here today on behalf of New York FarmNet. We're a not-for-profit program. We provide free and confidential on-farm consulting. We'll come right to your kitchen table and talk about the issues that you have, whatever you'd like us to, to work on. Basically, there is no topic that we don't get into. So you, you, you can name it, <laughs> we've heard it. <clears throat> and uh, we are free and confidential. So you're not writing us any checks and everything that, that we talk about around the kitchen table stays there unless you sign a, a release of information form for instance, for an attorney or a lender or something that some person you think would uh, would add to the conversation. But we do work in uh, teams of two, one focusing on financial issues, that's myself, and one focusing on family or personal issues. And we work throughout New York State. Uh, any farmer can contact uh, FarmNet 24-7 by calling the 1-800 number and uh, or you can visit the website and submitting a request. Uh, most of the time you'll get a live person. You might get a recording that'll call you back, but uh, they will refer us, uh, the consultants, and we'll accept the case and then we'll set up a time to come to your farm. So we've been, we've been in operation since 1986 and there's about 40 of us throughout the state that do this kind of work. So uh, it's a great program and, and one that helped me greatly, my wife and I, uh, when we were in the final stages of, of exiting the business. Okay, next slide. So today I, I wanted to touch on the topic of farm transitions and farm succession planning. And you, you can hardly pick up a farm magazine anymore. And there isn't an article or two in there about succession planning, um, estate planning, transi transitioning to the next generation. Um, it's a very, very popular topic that people write about, but it doesn't draw a lot of interest. You know, so it's one of those things we can put that off. We'll talk about that next winter and then next winter. And so so that's going to be kind of part of what I'm going to talk about today is let's not put it off. So go ahead. <clears throat> so let's get started. Let's do it now. Let's speak up. We need all generations involved. Um, and I think that is really a key point of what I want to, want to talk about today. Uh, so many times we don't talk about it. Dad said he always wanted me to take over the farm, but Dad is 70 now. He's had some health issues and he's still really not done anything. And now I'm almost 50, you know? So, 
So speak up. Let's do it now. Let's get started. And we need everybody to be involved. A lot of time, the younger generation is is a little bit reluctant to to say their piece and how they how they feel and how their wives and families feel about this. Okay. <clears throat> so the earlier the better. Only twenty five percent of farms have identified a successor, and a more a majority seventy five percent of farmers will never retire. I know when I was in my 20s, I can remember saying, well, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to do this forever, you know. But you get older, things change. And uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> Ideally, and this is what we, we like to see, which is the best scenario, is this process could start with a younger generation in their 20s or 30s. And it doesn't have to be just family. It could be a non-family member. We see this quite often these days is bringing in a non-farm, uh, non-family member onto the farm. Um, you know, these days, folks are getting married later in life. They're, they're having children later in life. Um, a lot of times, and we, we think this is a good idea, they might go and work in another business for four or five years before they actually come back home to the family business. So, We've kind of pushed that <clears throat> that window a little bit further down the road, but we don't want to wait too long. Too often, and I this is unfortunately what I deal with most of the farm that uh, the younger generation is now in their late forties or even fifties, and mom and dad are in their seventies, maybe, <laughs> and maybe had uh, I've got one now. Dad's had two heart attacks. And we got a call last Christmas time. We got to do something right now. <laughs> well, we're still talking about it. We're still trying to work it out, but our options are so limited under that scenario. And, and if we'd have talked about this, the sun has been there over 25 years. If we just started talking about that, this back then, we'd have a lot more chances for success. So the options are limited the farther we farther we go down the road, the more that we wait. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so we really need to understand the current farm structure. Who owns the assets? Who owns the debt, if there is any? And what are the goals and needs for the business, for retirement and for inheritance? So on some farms, the farm, in fact, in most families, the farm is their retirement. And so is there going to be room for retirement funds plus an ongoing business? And what about inheritance? And we'll get into that uh, more later, but uh, a lot of times we'll have one or two children that are on the farm and have been there and provided sweat equity for a number of years. And then we might have two or three uh, siblings that have never shown any interest in the farm and have moved away. What does the will say? Do we treat everybody equally or is there an equitable distribution? So these are very important things. And uh, who owns the assets, who owns the debt? Uh, we, we see that on a balance sheet. Uh, we'll quite often get into a farm and mom will say she's always done the books. Well, what do you need that for? You know, I'm not. And a lot of farm families are quite, they hold their finances quite close to the vest. And uh, we really need to understand what the situation is and if the next generation owns anything uh, or if they've been strictly an employee. Okay, we can move on. <clears throat> so these are some of the, the common farm succession tensions. Uh, letting go versus retaining control, the transfer of knowledge and management is just as important as the financial transfer. And I'm sure you all know uh, farm families and dad's the boss. And when the decision making time comes, maybe the kids have got some input, but dad's going to make a decision. And dad has not really been willing to let go. Um, even this one case that I have, they're in their 70s. And yeah, he wants to transfer the farm, but he, he wants to keep the decision-making 
in his pocket. So I think it's really important, and this can this needs to start early. You know, in my case, uh, we had a dairy farm, and my dad we had uh, cows. Uh, we had eighty Jersey cows when I came home, and uh, uh, orchard and thirty six acres of orchard, and the crops to support the, the dairy. And my dad pretty much turned the dairy decision making over to me, uh, the feeding and the breeding. And we, of course, cross shared everything, but uh, he kind of gave me enough rope to hang myself. And he kind of let me make some decisions that were the wrong decisions, but he let me do it. And that was invaluable, I think, in the, in the learning process. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times we talk about transition and farm succession planning, and, and we talk about the assets and transferring them, but just as important is the transfer of knowledge and management to the next generation. Fair versus equal, I, I talked about this a little bit in the previous slide. Uh, I have a very strong feeling that those children that have shown an interest and have put in sweat equity, um, they deserve a break to be able to get back on, get to, to maintain the farm. Um, in my case, uh, there was there was uh, two boys, my my brother and myself, and then and my two sisters. And very early on, uh, in fact, they were still in high school. Uh, my parents made it clear that you know they they had no intentions of come back to the farm, and they they said, "Well, you're not gonna you're not gonna inherit the farm." So uh, my dad passed in '99, and my mom just passed. Uh, well, I guess it was 2019 and just before COVID hit. <clears throat> and they got some cash, but they didn't get any of the farm assets that were left. We'd been buying the farm over the last 25, 30 years. Uh, but they understood that and they were fine with that. And there was no family divisiveness because of that. Um, I, got a, I got a call just, uh, we've been working with a family for, three or four years and unfortunately dad has died and now everything is left to the widow. She has five children, one is on the farm. She so wants to, to leave the, all her assets equally to all her children. And it's been a real struggle to get her convinced that if we want the farm to continue, um, I mean, when they bought it, 40, 50 years ago, it was probably twenty dollars or $30,000 farm. Now it's a million dollar farm. And, and the farm can't survive if the one sibling that's on the farm has to buy out his other, his other four. So I think that's, that's a very uh, strong point and one that a lot of, a lot of parents can't see. Uh, profitability versus, profit versus affordability. So, Pretty obvious point. Difficult to transfer an unprofitable business, and we'll we'll get into farms where they haven't been making any money, and they've obviously needed to make changes, and they haven't they haven't made changes. Um, so maybe the next generation realizes what needs to change for the to turn the business around, and maybe we can make that happen. Um, is gifting a, a consideration? You know, a lot of these farms nowadays, uh, we had one about a year ago now that we started, $50 million in assets, you know, and how in the world is the next generation going to buy with a figure that, that big? And so there does need to be some gifting considerations. I'm not saying you need to give everything to the next generation. They need to work for it and earn it, but it is one thing we need to think about. <clears throat> Uh, the lady just uh, yesterday, she said, well, we, we worked so hard to build this farm, you know, and nobody gave us anything. And now am I supposed to give it to my son? Probably somewhere in between gifting and a, and a reduced price is the answer. Assumptions versus actual conversations. You know, a lot of times families don't talk about this subject. And dad may have one assumption that the son or daughter is going to come in and, and uh, take over. 
when he's basically on his deathbed. And the son may have a, a completely different uh, assumption. And so it's so important um, to have family communication. And that's one thing that FarmNet can do. We can get everybody around the table and we can, we can facilitate the discussion and get a lot of these issues that folks aren't willing to talk about on their own on the table. Progress versus stay the same as a business competitive. And that goes up to the unprofitable business. You know, we get into, and I'm a dairy farmer. We'll get into farms where they have a tie stall barn, 80 cows, it takes three of them to do the chores. The last update they did was they put a pipeline in in 1960. They haven't changed anything since. And um, their cost of production is, is so high now that uh, if there wasn't a lot of unpaid family labor, they would not be in business. And so has the business been changing? And that's something every business needs to do. They need to, to stay with the times and, and stay competitive. So uh, that the less competitive they are, um, you know, the, the harder it is to transfer that business. Uh, one case, uh, three people doing chores, mom and dad want to retire. The son has got to hire two people to replace mom and dad. He's got to buy the farm or some part of it, service that debt, plus provide him and his wife with a living wage besides. And the numbers are tough, they really are. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> So we've got a few things here to consider uh, for a successful transfer, and they do happen. Uh, next slide. And this one is, is super important. Uh, build a team of advisors that everyone respects. It includes consultants, accountants, lawyers, tax specialists, financial planners, and lenders. In my case, uh, in the last one, when, when I was getting ready to, to retire. Well, I wasn't really ready to retire, but <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, I wasn't ready. Um, we brought FarmNet in. My wife and I brought FarmNet in, and we had a wonderful consultant. At that time, it was just, they were working in, in just one at a time. And we and we we loved the guy, and we, to this day, have a great relationship with him. Um, we brought another uh, farm net person in for my brother. He hated everything he said. He disagreed with, and so didn't work. Didn't work. We finally, I can remember one. We got around my mother's uh, dining room table. There was nine of us at one time. There was a tax attorney. Uh, there was our lender. There was the attorney that was. Uh, writing the the LLC uh, and the buyout and and she brought he brought an assistant with him and then we had uh, two financial planners who you know in plain speak they want to sell life insurance and and sometimes that can fit sometimes that can be a good uh, a good answer to, to a, a part of it but everybody working together my brother and I uh, and, and my nephew respected everybody around the table, and that was a key to make the thing work. So very, very important. And until you get that, uh, you're really kind of at a roadblock. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Um, should everybody have the same lawyer, or should, like I have one lawyer, my kids sit the is there a conflict of interest if you only deal with one lawyer? There can be. It depends on what part of the transition we're, we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, a formation of a new LLC and the buyout, another partner or something like that, one common lawyer can do that. But when we're talking about uh, wills, individual, we need, we need separate attorneys for sure. Okay. Yeah. And they know, they might not, I mean, it, this team are not going to meet all together every time. There'll be a lot of separate meetings. Um, this process can take 
two or three years, you know, of, of working at it. In my case, we would have a meeting and your, your head would be swirling with all these things, ideas and, and potential solutions. And you have to think about it for a while. And then we got to get back to the table again. You know, let's not put it off six months or a year. So next slide. So I talked about this a little bit before. What does each generation own and owe? And so we do need an up-to-date balance sheet for all parties, uh, not just for mom and dad, but for the, the prospective junior partners coming in. They might own some cattle uh, or some other assets. And when we, when we bring things together, we're probably gonna blend these assets in some fashion. And so we really need to have a discovery on what each generation owns and owes. Um, and like I said before, that can be a touchy subject. A lot of people don't want to share their finances. So uh, important information to have, okay? <clears throat> so what is the goal of the farm owners? Uh, we can transfer the ownership in steps and not all at once operating assets versus real estate. So in my case, that's what I did when I first came home. Um, Dad gave me a note for the cattle and machinery, and we had a partnership just on those operating assets. And mom and dad owned the real estate. And the operating uh, partnership, dad and I rented the real estate from mom and dad. And then as time went on, um, he started to sell me parts of the real estate. So it doesn't need to happen all at once. Uh, in some very small operations, it's probably simpler to do it that way. Uh, but in these large operations where we, we're talking millions of dollars in many cases, uh, it's a lot better to just start start slow and start with, with uh, the actual operating assets. You know, the, like in a fruit farm, you know, uh, maybe your rolling stock and, and uh, with a dairy farm, your cattle machinery. Okay. <clears throat> what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the parties? So sometimes we'll, we'll see that maybe dad was, uh, dad was the cow guy and the two sons are coming in. They really like to drive tractors. They like the crowds. So who's going to manage the cows? So I think it's very important to have synergy here. Uh, in my case, I was a cow, get, cow guy. My, my brother was the machinery guy and crop guy. And uh, even though we butted heads for 30 years, we built a successful business uh, because we each had, I mean, and we crossed over all, every day. But uh, he had his, uh, his area of expertise and I had mine. So I think it's very important to, to determine around the kitchen table then again where uh, who's gonna who's gonna manage these things and and if there is a weakness, how are we gonna fill that in? Okay, next slide. How is the business financially now? So we do need just as though we need a, as well, we need a balance sheet. We need to uh, see a profit and loss statement. And you would be surprised, but the number of farms I get into and all the information's all in that shoebox and we haven't filed our taxes in two or three or four years. <laughs> and I've been astounded at the amount of that I've run into. And it, until we can sort through that information and find out what you know the profitability of the, of the business is, uh, it's really tough to know what we're what we're really transferring. Um, this is why uh, having an accountant or a bookkeeper on the team is really important to, to get that information. And there again, mom and dad have got to be willing to, you know, to let that, give that up. I mean, I, I know of cases where uh, the son is in his 50s, he's never seen the checkbook. So, you know, it's just, uh, a pretty sad situation, but we need to reveal where the business is and have an understanding by everyone as to what the what the financial situation is. Okay. 
what are the family living needs and is it off farm income? So mom and dad are gonna retire. And I asked the question, what, what do you think it's gonna take you? Uh, how much is it gonna cost you to live? And the answer that I invariably get is, well, we live on $5,000 or less a year. Well, they have one checkbook for the farm and their personal. They get their gas out of the farm tank. Uh, they get a beef or two a year. Um, their electric bill, their heating bill is all paid by the farm. And they really don't understand what it costs uh, in family living needs. Once they're out of the business and they don't have all those, those perks, uh, what's it going to take for us to live? And uh, we do have some worksheets that uh, uh, have been developed that are, that are quite handy to help folks uh, with that. And generally, farm families are pretty frugal. They're not going to spend their winters in a rural boat or anything like that. But we need to know what that number is and, and what are the sources of income um, they're going to contribute to that family living need. Uh, sometimes uh, the wife has had a, a job off the farm and she's going to continue for a number of years. That's great if that's the case and we need, we need to know that. Uh, Social Security comes into play. Are there other uh, investments? Uh, oftentimes, um, it, it still floors me. Uh, we have a woman at the end of the table in a, in a walker. In, in her mid 80s. And I was quite concerned about her family living needs, you know, but she was transferring the farm over and the, the financial planner was there. And uh, he said, well, should we tell him? Well, it turned out she had $3 million in the bank. <laughs> so she was just fine. <laughs> we didn't need to worry about her a bit, you know, but that's not always the case. And in, in most cases, um, the fa everything has been poured into the farm, and the farm is their their retirement. And so we have to sort that out, and how that's how that's going to uh, continue on. Because obviously, our first we want the farm to continue, but mom and dad have got to survive. They've got they've got to be able to continue to live. Okay. So we talked about this a little bit already. Has transition of management been occurring and if it hasn't why not and how are we going to change that so uh, this is a big one and probably you know if this hasn't been happening all along um, the chance of success is is pretty slim um, if if a fellow in his or or a woman in in his his or her 50s gets thrown into a business where they haven't seen the books they, they don't know what it takes to manage the accounts. Um, they don't know what it takes to manage the, for instance, a dairy herd or an apple orchard or a beef farm. Um, it's gonna be really tough. So that's why I think my first, uh, first point was let's start early and, and let's keep at it. So, okay, number eight. What is the timeline? Communication of expectations. So in my case, uh, I think I was uh, in my late 60s and there was nine of us around the table and we had gotten down to the short rows and pretty well figured out the buyout. And, and I said, you know, I don't think I'm quite ready. Well, my brother threw his pen to the ceiling and he said, well, we're going to call the auctioneer and we're going to have an auction. We're done. He, he was ready to take over, okay, more so than I ever realized. And he and his brother wanted to be in control of the business. I'd been the senior partner for 25, 30 years. And although we made decisions together, I had to be double. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I was a senior member. So, so that was a real eye opener for me. And, and I thought about it for a little while, for a week or two, and I said, yeah, it's probably, it probably is time. So we need to, we need to 
you know, we need to find out what that is. Uh, I was on a fruit farm uh, eight or nine months ago and uh, transferring it over. The sun had been taking more and more management and they actually had a, a partnership on the operating side. And uh, dad said, well, mom and I are gonna take a, a trip on the Canadian Rockies uh, Railroad. And we're gonna leave September 1st. And son says, Dad, that's harvest time. What do you mean you're leaving that, you know, the beginning of apple harvest? So what is the timeline? Communication of extra expectations and total shocker there, and in my case too, as to as to what the timeline is. Okay. <clears throat> so what are the estate plans? Uh, estate planning is is really separate but involved with uh, the transition. So your estate, what you own and owe, and, and what's going to happen to it when you pass on uh, is so very important. Does everyone have a will? That's one of the first questions I ask. Uh, the worst thing in the world is to have no will. So if even if we don't like what the will say, says, at least you have a will. Um, I was in a very sad situation um, just a few weeks ago. There is no will. And and the partner died. And even though the lady would like to continue the farm, it's probably going to, New York State, when this thing goes into probate, uh, the New York State is going to say it's going to go to his children. So does everyone have a, a will? And that could be the simplest part of this whole piece. And in an afternoon, you can go to your, your local attorney and, and get that done, except maybe in your case, <laughs> where you don't know what you ought to do yet. But very, very important. And then Medicaid protection. And this is, this is becoming more and more important. And I kind of see it in two you know, two of the haves and the have-nots, the very, the very, um, I guess I'll call them the rich, wealthy um, farmers, they're going to take care of their own, you know, they're going to take care of their own uh, uh, long-term nursing care, for instance. Uh, but my my mom, mom was in uh, assisted living for, for a couple of years. Um, the problem is that once you run out of cash, once she runs out of cash, then she starts, then they start going towards the nursing home will put uh, uh, liens against her other property. And so there's a lot of things. This is a, this is a whole day's uh, subject just on Medicaid protection, but we can, we can do a lot of things to transfer property or put it in a trust, an irrevocable trust. Um, in, in some cases, it's it's not an issue at all. So, but it's something we need we need to think about because uh, I don't know. I I keep hearing it goes up all the time, but ten, twelve, fifteen dollars a month for nursing care, you know, long term nursing care these days, and and insurance, long term insurance for that is just out of sight, unaffordable anymore. So, so yeah, Medicaid protection. What about divorce and prenup? This is one that it's kind of a touchy subject and some people don't like to talk about it, but while we're all friends and we still all love each other, maybe this is the time we ought to be talking about it. And particularly if there's, there's uh, uh, multiple siblings in a business and they have concerns about the youngest son is just getting married and they don't necessarily like her. <laughs> And so it does give a level of comfort to the business to have, uh, have a prenup. Um, so I, like I say, it's kind of a touchy subject and, and a lot of people don't like to talk about it. And in many cases, maybe we don't need to talk about it, but uh, it, is, it is an issue, can be an issue. Um, I, uh, full disclosure, I've been married twice and uh, divorced twice. And um, the first time my wife wanted half. Nice. And, um, but we got through it. 
and uh, she got the house and I got the, the mortgage. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a great equalizer, but it can be, uh, and there was a big concern in my family at the time. Um, so it can be an issue. And the bottom line is, will the farm survive? You know, if we, if we have a big payout, um, a majority owner in the business goes through a divorce and he has to pay out half and the farm survive that. If they're heavily leveraged already, maybe not. Okay. Peter is sleeping. So this is uh, just the obvious here that I talked about throughout. Communicate, 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 and keep at it. Um, and you can you can have overkill on this too, obviously. Uh, but there's 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 a good level here where you just need to keep moving moving this along. And this is something that FarmNet can help facilitate is is continuing the conversation. Uh, a lot of times we'll get a call and we'll have two or three meetings and then they go silent. And maybe 18 months later, we'll, hey, we got to get this thing wrapped up. Well, the ABC have been communicating in the meantime. And so we've got to re restart all the conversations over again. Okay. So this is, uh, there's 10 pitfalls of succession planning, and I'll go through these one by one if you want to go to the next slide. So waiting too long. Uh, I've got a case right now where uh, dad's ready now, dad's in his 70s, and his son says, you know what, dad, I've been here 30 years, and I don't have anything, and I got a, I got a good job in town offered to me. I'm going. I'm done. And so if we had started that conversation 25 or 30 years before now, uh, we could have avoided that. The farm business doesn't change. So I talked about that. We, we, we haven't made any, any business changes in 25 or 30 years. Uh, we're not as competitive as we used to be. And uh, so transferring a, a business that's not competitive is really tough. And then tax laws can change. And they, you know, we're coming up on another presidential election here. And who knows what, what tax laws are going to be like in one, two, or three years. Uh, so the sooner we can get those things, transitions made with the tax laws we know now, uh, the better off we'll be. Okay. So not defining succession goals. We do need a timeline. We've talked about that. Is, is everybody on the same page? Um, is your timeline in two years and dad's is in 15 or 20? We need, we need to talk about that and make sure we're on the, on the same page. And we need to measure progress. How are we doing? You know, we said we were going to go to the lawyer. Uh, we said we were going to develop an LLC. But hey, we haven't done that. You know, what's going on? So very important there. What are our goals? And then again, tax laws can change, uh, you know, over time. Okay. Not grooming the next generation, the big pitfall. And we talked about this. So often the next generation becomes cheap labor. And maybe they're living with mom and dad. And... Uh, They've been there 80 or 100 hours a week for a long, long time. And I'm astounded at some of the, some of the pay scales and some of these, this next generation. And it's all because they couldn't afford anymore to pay them. And, and uh, they just become cheap labor. Uh, need time for side-by-side -side management. It just takes, it just takes time. You can't, as you, you know, you can't turn over uh, the reins and then walk away. There needs to be some, some guidance there, some leadership from the older generation. And that, that takes some time. Um, depending on the generation, uh, five to 10 years probably. Uh, so yeah, allow the next generation to assume management responsibilities. 
and and just oversee, but give them responsibilities and, and just see how they see how they do. And if they get into trouble, you're there to, to guide them along. And then communicate, review performance. How 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 are we doing? And I can remember we, we would always do the books when we did taxes there again around mom's dining room table and at the end of the year and we kind of go over how each of us in our area was doing and and uh you know where we could do better and uh, it didn't always go real well when your dad was telling you that you know you you could have done better in this area or that so okay <clears throat> write the agreement but not implement so we see this quite often. We'll, we'll go to the lawyer and we'll write up an LLC and life is good. It's all rainbows. Well, you also have to transfer the assets. It has to be something recorded in the courthouse that says that you actually own uh, some percentage of, of uh, this business now. Uh, if there's nothing like that going on, you have an LLC, but it really doesn't mean anything. Keep the capital accounts current. Um, so maybe you start out with zero and you have a profit sharing arrangement with mom and dad. And let's say it's 50%. And the next year you will own, we'll say 5% of the business. And the next year, maybe you'll own 7.5% of the business. Well, every year we need to settle up and see what, what that figure is so that we if something happens to either partner, we know just how much of the business is owned by, by either partner. So keep those capital accounts current. We see quite often that they haven't been kept current in as many as eight or 10 years. And then that can be a problem. We have to come in and, and get a, a farm appraisal of all the assets and try and figure out where we're at, okay? Implement a plan without understanding. So ask a lot of questions. You know, these, these things can be complicated. And we get the attorney in the room and they start rattling off a, a lot of uh, legalese. Uh, my, my LLC at the end was about two and a half inches thick. You know? And uh, so, and even today, I, well, what about this or that? You know? So um, ask a lot of questions. Make sure you understand completely uh, what's going on before you sign on the dotted line. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's, that's a very, very important part, okay? Lack of personal business objective transparency, and that can create mistrust. So, yeah, so maybe dad, mom and dad decided that, hey, we're gonna ride this thing out to the end, and this is our retirement. We're just gonna sell when, when the time is right. And the next generation is coming along thinking the business is going to continue. And they have different goals. They have different objectives. And once they get an inkling of what's going on, we've, we've created mistrust. So we just, there, there again, it goes back to communications and understanding what everybody's, what everybody's interest is. Okay. And I've talked about this equitable and not equal, and I and I feel very strongly about this. Some people don't. I'm going to treat all my kids the same. They're all my kids, and I love them all. I'm going to treat them all the same. Versus, I'm going to treat them equitably, and the ones that have put in the sweat equity are the ones that are going to have the farm in the future. So, uh, so many times, will the farm survive? The answer is no. If we we go to a, an equal situation. So, and, and a lot of folks can't wrap their, their minds around that, that. And I think their hearts that they need to feel like they need to treat all their kids the same. Um, and the, the woman I talked to yesterday, some of them, Arkansas was up. He's never had one thing to do with the farm. Not one, but she wants to treat him equally. And uh, so it, I think this is a this is a huge one. It's one my dad got early on and he drained into me. And uh, and so it's yeah, I think it's a very important feature. Okay. 
Uh, choosing poor farm ownership. Uh, when I started out, we had we were before the days of LLCs, and now we're we're into these LLCs, limited liability uh, companies, and they're kind of a neat form of ownership. Uh, we can the entity can own the asset, be it real estate or an operating asset. In my case, we had two LLCs, one for the operating and one for the real estate. I kind of I kind of like that. In my case, when I got out of the business, I got bought out of the operating LLC. The real estate LLC remained intact. My brother and I, to this day, uh, still own the, the uh, real estate operating, the, the real estate LLC. Um, members of the LLC can go in and out. And you don't need to go to the courthouse because the, the LLC owns, that's the entity that owns, the deed is in that LLC's name. So you can change percentages, you can change ownership within the LLC very easily uh, without having to go through and pay mortgage tax and all that kind of thing. Um, C-Corps provide a lot of the same protection. Uh, you, you, you really have a veil of protection uh, liability protection. Uh, for instance, if we have a, a, our operating LLC, the milk and parlor, all the cows, the bunk silos, everything that's going on that's high risk, manure storage is everything, is in one LLC. If something happens within that LLC, they can sue that LLC, but they can't go out and take the rest of the farm. So it's a nice, nice uh, veil of protection that way. You get the same thing with a C Corp. Uh, an S Corp, those are um, probably 25, 30, 40 years old now. Uh, I've only run across one uh, terrible situation. Uh, the owners are all in their late 80s and 90s. Um, the management team that was running the business that was actually in their 40s and 50s owned very, very little as of the S Corp. <clears throat> and, the, and the owners were only looking for a return on investment. And even their, their children had, re, had long since retired. And so they were really handheld their uh, hands tied behind their back. And I don't know just where that is gonna go. We're, we contemplate the idea of forming a new LLC and, and buy out the assets of the S Corp over time. But uh, the other problem in that instance is it's not a profitable business. So uh, we've got several, and we've got a lot of internal family conflicts. So we've got a lot of things going on there. Uh, joint tenancy versus tenancy in common. That's just uh, uh, my wife and I own the house together. If I pass away, uh, 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 sole survivorship, the house goes to her, it doesn't have to go through probate. Uh, that's just, to me, is, is the most common sense way to own property. Uh, tenancy in common, I own 70%, somebody else owns 30%. They can go ahead and sell their 30% without my say-so. Um, it's a lot tougher at the time of death and, and uh, has to go through probate. So joint tenancy is kind of what we we recommend. Uh, number nine, allow the process to stagnate. Keep at it. Yeah, this and this this happens all the time. We got started at it and then we got busy and maybe we, there was a health issue. There's a lot of good reasons. And here it is two years later and we haven't gone any farther. Um, so keep at it. Keep at it. I think that's, I mean, there's in my dad's case, when I came home, when my brother came home, when my dad got out, those were all milestone events where we, we actually changed the structure of the business and, and didn't put it off, you know, until it was, was a problem. Um, so, yeah, keep at it. Number 10, it's ever evolving. A situation changed, so will your plan. Uh, just like somebody retired yesterday and it's a big surprise and you've got to get used to it. You know, it's, it, things are ever, 
ever changing, ever evolving. And so the, once you get the succession plan in place, it's not cast in stone. It's going to change over time, and and you can you can expect it to change. So, um, in my case, I've been out seven years. My brother and I over here own uh, real estate together in a separate LLC. Last year, I sold one farm. So, so uh, the relationship is is different than it was at the beginning. So, um, just keep in mind that. Why? It's really great. We got this done. We don't ever have to think about this again. We don't have to think about it tomorrow, but things are going to come up. Maybe the sister who is 14 now wants to come back or her husband into the farm in, in five or 10 years. And so, so yeah, it's ever evolving. So where are we at? So yeah, so that's, uh, that's the end of the road. And uh, how did we do? A little bit over, I don't know. Yeah. So do y'all have any questions uh, uh, on what I've said? I do want a disclaimer that we, FarmNet does not offer legal advice and we do not offer tax advice. So that's why we have resources and specialists to, uh, to weigh in on those topics. So don't ask me legal questions.